we have all read in scientific books and indeed in all romances the story of the man who has forgotten his name this man walks about the streets and can see and appreciate everything only he cannot remember who he is well every man is that man in the story every man has forgotten who he is one may understand the cosmos but never the ego the self more distant than any star thou shalt love the lord thy god but thou shalt not know thyself we are all under the same mental calamity we have all forgotten our names we have all forgotten what we really are all that we call common sense and rationality and practicality and positivism only means that for certain dead levels of our life we forget that we have forgotten all that we call spirit and art and ecstasy only means that for one awful instant we remember that we forget but though like the man without memory in the novel we walk the streets with a sort of half-witted admiration still it is admiration it is admiration in english and not only admiration in latin the wonder has a positive element of praise this is the next milestone to be definitely marked on our road through fairyland i shall speak in the next chapter about optimists and pessimists in their intellectual aspect so far as they have one here i am only trying to describe the enormous emotions which cannot be described and the strongest emotion was that life was as precious as it was puzzling it was an ecstasy because it was an adventure it was an adventure because it was an opportunity the goodness of the fairy tale was not affected by the fact that there may be more dragons than princesses it was good to be in a fairy tale the test of all happiness is gratitude and i felt grateful though i hardly knew to whom children are grateful when santa claus puts in their stockings gifts of toys or sweets could i not be grateful to santa claus when he put in my stockings the gift of two miraculous legs we thank people for birthday presents of cigars and slippers can i thank no one for the birthday present of birth there were then these two first feelings indefensible and indisputable the world was a shock but it was not merely shocking existence was a surprise but it was a pleasant surprise in fact all my first views were exactly uttered in a riddle that stuck in my brain from boyhood the question was what did the first frog say and the answer was lord how you made me jump that says succinctly all that i am saying god made the frog jump but the frog prefers jumping but when these things are settled there enters the second great principle of the fairy philosophy any one can see it who will simply read grimm's fairy tales or the fine collections of mr andrew lang for the pleasure of pedantry i will call it the doctrine of conditional joy touchstone talked of much virtue in an if according to elfin ethics all virtue is in an if the note of the fairy utterance always is you may live in a palace of gold and sapphire if you do not say the word cow or you may live happily with the king's daughter if you do not show her an onion the vision always hangs upon a veto all the dizzy and colossal things conceded depend upon one small thing withheld all the wild and whirling things that are let loose depend upon one thing that is forbidden mr w b yeats in his exquisite and piercing elfin poetry describes the elves as lawless they plunge in innocent anarchy on the unbridled horses of the air ride on the crest of the dishevelled tide and dance upon the mountains like a flame it is a dreadful thing to say that w b yeats does not understand fairyland but i do say it he is an ironical irishman full of intellectual reactions he's not stupid enough to understand fairyland fairies prefer people of the yokel type like myself people who gape and grin and do as they are told mr yeats reads into elfland all the righteous insurrection of his own race but the lawlessness of ireland is a christian lawlessness rounded on reason and justice the finian is rebelling against something he understands only too well but the true citizen of fairyland is obeying something that he does not understand at all in the fairy tale an incomprehensible happiness rests upon an incomprehensible condition a box is opened and all evils fly out a word is forgotten and cities perish a lamp is lit and love flies away a flower is plucked and human lives are forfeited an apple is eaten 
and the hope of God is gone. This is the tone of fairy tales, and it is certainly not lawlessness or even liberty, though men under a mean modern tyranny may think it liberty by comparison. People out of Portland Gale might think Fleet Street free, but closer study will prove that both fairies and journalists are the slaves of duty. Fairy godmothers seem at least as strict as other godmothers. Cinderella received a coach out of Wonderland and a coachman out of nowhere, but she received a command, which might have come out of Brixton, that she should be back by twelve. Also she had a glass slipper, and it cannot be a coincidence that glass is so common a substance in folklore. This princess lives in a glass castle, that princess on a glass hill. This one sees all things in a mirror. They may all live in glass houses if they will not throw stones. For this thin glitter of glass everywhere is the expression of the fact that the happiness is bright but brittle, like the substance most easily smashed by a housemaid or a cat. And this fairy tale sentiment also sank into me, and became my sentiment toward the whole world. I felt and feel that life itself is as bright as the diamond, but as brittle as the window pane. And when the heavens were compared to the terrible crystal, I can remember a shudder. I was afraid that God would drop the cosmos with a crash. End of chapter 4, part 1「Orthodoxy » by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 4 – The Ethics of Elfland Part 2 Remember, however, that to be breakable is not the same as to be perishable. Strike a glass, and it will not endure an instant. Simply do not strike it, and it will endure a thousand years. Such, it seemed, was the joy of man, either in Elfland or on earth. The happiness depended on not doing something, which you could at any moment do, and which very often it was not obvious why you should not do. Now the point here is that to me this did not seem unjust. If the miller's third son said to the fairy, Explain why I must not stand on my head in the fairy palace, the other might fairly reply, Well, if it comes to that, explain the fairy palace. If Cinderella says, How is it that I must leave the ball at twelve, her godmother might answer, how is it that you are going there till twelve? If I leave a man in my will ten talking elephants and a hundred winged horses, he cannot complain if the conditions partake of the slight eccentricity of the gift. He must not look a winged horse in the mouth. And it seemed to me that existence was itself so very eccentric a legacy that I could not complain of not understanding the limitations of the vision when I did not understand the vision they limited. The frame was no stranger than the picture. The veto might well be as wild as the vision. It might be as startling as the sun, as elusive as the waters, as fantastic and terrible as the towering trees. For this reason, we may call it the fairy godmother philosophy, I could never join the young men of my time in feeling what they called the general sentiment of revolt. I should have resisted, let us hope, any rules that were evil, and with these and their definition I shall deal in another chapter but I did not feel disposed to resist any rule merely because it was mysterious. Estates are sometimes held by foolish forms, the breaking of a stick or the payment of a peppercorn. I was willing to hold the huge estate of earth and heaven by any such feudal fantasy. It could not well be wilder than the fact that I was allowed to hold it at all. At this stage I will give only one ethical instance to show my meaning. I could never mix in the common murmur of that rising generation against monogamy, because no restriction on sex seemed so odd and unexpected as sex itself. To be allowed, like Endymion, to make love to the moon, and then to complain that Jupiter kept his own moons in a harem, seemed to me, read on fairy tales like Endymion's, a vulgar anticlimax. Keeping to one woman is a small price for so much as seeing one woman. To complain that I could only be married once was like complaining that I had only been born once. It was incommensurate with the terrible excitement of which one was talking. It showed not an exaggerated sensibility to sex, but a curious insensibility to it. A man is a fool who complains that he cannot enter Eden by five gates at once. Polygamy is a lack of the realization of sex. It is like a man plucking five pears in mere absence of mind. The aesthetes touch the last insane limits of language in their eulogy on lovely things. 
the thistle-down made them weep, a burnished beetle brought them to their knees, yet their emotion never impressed me for an instant for this reason, that it never occurred to them to pay for their pleasure in any sort of symbolic sacrifice. Men, I felt, might fast forty days for the sake of hearing a blackbird sing. Men might go through fire to find a cowslip. Yet these lovers of beauty could not even keep sober for the blackbird. They would not go through common Christian marriage by way of recompense for the cowslip. Surely one might pay for extraordinary joy in ordinary morals. Oscar Wilde said that sunsets were not valued because we could not pay for sunsets. But Oscar Wilde was wrong. We can pay for sunsets. We can pay for them by not being Oscar Wilde. 